I'm Dr. Vanessa Sinclair, and this is Rendering Unconscious. My guest today is prolific musician Ramsey Jones. Based in New York City, his bands include Rebelmatic, Funk Face, Funky Nomads, Maffa, Backslider, Abstract, and Dancing Dream. He comes from a musically talented family and records, performs, and tours with them, including the Rizza, Jizza, and Wu-Tang Clan. Most recently, he performed Liquid Swords as a live band with Jizza at the Blue Note, New York City. If you're in Florida, his band Dancing Dream will be performing at Bush Gardens February 8th to the 13th. You can follow him at Instagram at SatelliteJones65. That's S-A-T-E-L-L-I-T-E-J-O-N-E-S-6-5 at Instagram. Rendering Unconscious is also a book. Rendering Unconscious, Psychoanalytic Perspectives, Politics, and Poetry, available from Chapart Books, 2019. You can visit our publisher's website, chapart.net. That's T-R-A-P-A-R-T dot net. You can also follow me at Instagram and Twitter at Raw Sin underscore. That's R A W S I N underscore at Instagram and Twitter. You can support the podcast at our Patreon, patreon.com forward slash Vanessa 23 Carl. Your support is greatly appreciated. Thank you so much for supporting Rendering Unconscious Podcast and all of my other creative endeavors. Ramsey, it's so nice to see you. I haven't seen you in forever. Yes, it's a pleasure seeing you in this long time, Vanessa. After the COVID and the, the pandemic and the shutdowns, you know, we're here. We're still here. <laughs> we're still here yeah thank that's God. real yeah <laughs> yeah i can tell you um i played a show at the blue note with jizza in march of 2020 march 8th right wow right that before night, lockdown yes like a day the i think the next day they said it was a lot there's gonna be a lockdown i think the next day or, the, or probably the week a week after that no that week it was that week and I was like, oh man, all my shows with Dancing Dream are canceled. All my other gigs are canceled. And that was my money. That was my breadwinner right there. And the following week, I got sick. Wow. <laughs> I got sick. Yeah. But it didn't last that long. I had a fever and um, I immediately went to bed. And uh, I got up like about four, three in the morning. I drink, I made some hot, boiled some hot water put apple cider vinegar like a teaspoon and honey and I just drank it as hot as I could and my temperature broke but my taste buds weren't the same um it was just like my body I was so weak it took like I was in the house for four months wow I didn't even go out I didn't leave I didn't even go down the stairs because I live on the second floor I didn't even go outside and look out. I just got kept getting up out the bed looking out the window like oh my god it's so it's like the city's at a standstill and yeah, four months. And the first time I actually got to playing was in July. And uh, I did a Prince Dirty Mind tribute with an artist named Chris Robb. And just starting to play drums again was like, it was like fresh to me. Like, oh, is this what, how you do it? You know, but it turned out amazing. It turned out amazing. It was the first live stream I did. Wow. Yeah, but I, I'm going way ahead of myself. I'll let you answer the question. <laughs> Ask me the questions. <laughs> no, I love to just talk and let it flow and see where it goes. Okay, okay. Totally fine with me. Yeah. So <laughs> yeah, 2020 was 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 um, I mean, it it was uh bad for everybody, but and 
I, I know, like I said, that was the first thing I did, the first time I actually played. And over the course of that year, 2020, I started to, to get, get shows with Dancing Dream. And there were a lot, a lot of gigs that were canceled, but there were shows coming up that were that they decided to open up, but you know, people were still feel fearful of the whole, you know, uh, catching the catching the virus and all that. And, and the vaccines weren't even discussed yet. I think it was like later that like probably the end of the year they were talking about that, you know? Mm -hmm. But yeah, I mean, I, I'm thankful I'm still here, knock on wood. You know, I, 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 I've been busy last year, 2021. That was, that was great. I mean, last year was amazing. So hopefully this year, you know, this Omicron thing, it's, it's like, it's dying down now. As they said, it's going down. So uh still at it i'm still doing it <laughs> yeah it must be really intense in new york though everyone that i talked to there said like for a while everything was shut down it was completely like dead like every everything was shut down and the streets were empty and it must have yeah. been so surreal i was working at I, I had gotten a job at the post office uh as a as a um as a clerk uh, and and what my job was i worked the graveyard shift this was December of 2021. I had to lift, put part, boxes, large boxes into like whatever zip code I was working in, I had to put large boxes into the metal containers that surrounded that zip code. And it was, it was great doing, working that, but it was like, I, I, my, my sleep patterns was all thawing out of kilter. And one night, <laughs> I was in the back. We took we took three breaks, which was great because you're working a graveyard shift and you take like two, uh, actually two one hour breaks. So I was sitting on the uh, mail basket. They got those mail baskets, the white mail baskets that kind of like a plastic. So I'm sitting on it, and then my coworkers are sitting in different areas, and we all sleep. We're all sitting and sleeping. So I just nod out like this. All of a sudden, I go, bow. I slammed my face right into the ground. Like the, like I had a fight with that, with the with the, with the floor. <laughs> and I jumped up out of shock and I was like looking around and everybody else was still asleep in their chairs or what have you. So I'm looking around, so I run to the bathroom. I look at my face, I'm like, oh God, I had a knot in this oh, side no. of my eye. <laughs> so <laughs> then our hour was up, we all went back to work. And my friend was like, yeah, yeah, you know, we're talking about the, the shift and everything. And I said, hey, um, I just I just came in contact with the floor. <laughs> so do you see anything on my face? She's like, oh, my God. Yeah, you got like a little knot on your your, your forehead right here, you know, your eye. Yeah, I said, yeah, I kissed the floor just like about half an hour ago. <laughs> so, but yeah, it was just trying to get adjusted to that shit. But working, I worked in 30th Street and in, in, uh, right near Madison Square, Madison Square Garden. So at night when I go on my break, I would go out and walk the streets and I'm like, man, I never seen 34th Street look like this in, wow. in all my, my life. It, it's been, it's like a ghost town. I, I, I literally stumbled upon a person that was shooting up. I mean, it was like, I was walking to work. And I was like, oh, what the hell? <laughs> and he's got a needle on his arm. He's like looking at me like, and he's still continuing doing it. I was like, I'm, I, I used to see that in the 70s, but this was like, wow, you know, it was this, like that, that's old New York has come back again mm -hmm. <laughs> it, during, the, during the pandemic. But I worked there from December, no, November 27th to January 1st of uh, 2021. And actually, no, it was, it was 20, it was the end of 2020 into 2021. That's, that's what I got dates mixed up. So uh, I did that. And then I got a call from the guy at the post, the manager at the post office. Says, hey, man, um, we decided to extend your tenure here. I'm like, really? Because it was just for the Christmas season. Mm -hmm. So I went, I went, I went this uh, after New Year's Day, I went back and worked. And I came, I, I, I worked that one night. And then the next morning when I was punching out, the manager says, oh, Ramsey, we made a mistake. Uh, you're not supposed to be working. <laughs> it was only temporary. I was like, okay, but he said, no, we'll pay you. Don't worry about that. But I did that for that time being, and it was cool, you know? But uh, yeah, I mean, it took a while for my gigs to come back. 
yeah exactly like for people who are working musicians I, all the shows got canceled and like totally stopped that whole year yeah it it was it was like i felt like a fish out of water but i i by by the luck of you know just being around a lot of people that i play with and i have i've had not only the dancing dream group but i have my own original bands like rebelmatic we actually put out an album and it came out during the pandemic Mark O'Connell from Taking Back Sunday produced it. And uh, it came out during 2020. So it was a bad time because we were gonna tour on, on, on that album and we ended up performing in the streets in the summer during the pandemic. Wow. So it was like, a, it was like, a, 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 like we were the Pied Pipers saving the, the neighborhood, you know, cause people were just so bored, cooped up in their house, they would come out we would post on Instagram, hey, we're playing here in Brooklyn. We would just, just DM us for the location. And the it started to build up, like the people coming to those shows and the word got around and they were like, the photographers would come and take pictures and document the whole scene. And we ended up getting a, a, a link up with this woman who's a, who was checking out our shows. She worked for Doc Martin. And she said, hey, I want to put you guys in this documentary, which you can go on, you can go on Doc Martin's website and look it up. It's DIY Punk in New York. We're like 100% in that, 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 that documentary, short documentary. I'll link so, to it too. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, it's great. It's a, it's, we got free shoes out of the deal. So it was cool. So, and also documenting this, our scene and uh, the punk scene all over New York and all over the country, actually. So it's, it's worth checking out. It's definitely worth checking out. How cool. But right now, Rebel Maddox is working on a new project, new album. And uh, I'm, also, I'm also in the group Maafa, which, which is headed by Flora Lucini. She's, uh, she's from Brazil. And uh, the whole family is a musical family, but that's an uh, Afro-progressive hardcore band. And... The third band I'm involved with is Backslider, which is Carolyn Honeychaw Coleman and Anu Guitar. And uh, we're a three piece. So that's more like a post-punk kind of uh, new wave, not new wave, but post-punk um, sound that we do. So that's and with psychedelic, psychedelia in it <laughs> and, and, and shoegaze. So it's pretty good. I'm all across the board. You know, and, and I, I just don't, I, I'm, I'm like a restless creature. I love, just like to delve into different things and I don't like to stay stuck in one style of music. I'm, I can't do that. I listen to everything. I'm open to everything. So that's why I'm involved with so many different groups. Funk Face, we're still around. We're still doing our thing. We did a show uh, last Christmas, you know, for uh, Jeff's birthday. And uh, that went well. 24-7 Spies was on the bill. Backslider was on the bill. And Funk Face, of course. So I played two sets in that, <laughs> that gig. So it was Backslider and Funk Face. Wow. Yeah. That was and like... You said next you're going summer. to Tampa? Yep. Next month I'm going to Tampa. I'm going to be playing at Bush Gardens for five days straight, 25 shows. So I can... <laughs> I don't know how you do that. <laughs> I, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm an energizer buddy, you know. I, <laughs> you know, I say this, you, 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 you love what you do, it's not work. That's what I say. If you do, you love what you do, it's not work. So I'm 56 years old. People, they can't believe I'm this old and I look this young. They think I'm in my 30s or 40s. But mm -hmm. I say it's all about being, comp being compassionate about what you, what you do. You know, because when you work at a job for, the, for all your life and it ages you because mm -hmm. you don't, you're, you're not happy doing it. You just, you just do it just to make a living, but it just ages you. And, and, and yeah, I don't want to, I don't want to work at something that I like is going to age me and, and, and uh, I got to retire and be old and sit in my house and like, what did I accomplish? <laughs> you know what I mean? So, exactly. It takes right, your and, energy. Whereas if you're doing something you love, it like gives you energy. Exactly, you know, and also I forgot to mention, I also play with my cousin Jizza from the Wu-Tang Clan, and we've been uh, doing live shows with uh, doing Liquid Swords and Wu-Tang uh, for the past 12 years now, 
So uh, we just performed a, last week at the Blue Note. We did two shows per night, Tuesday and Wednesday. We, and this is my sixth time playing here, especially with Jizza. So we, we've been welcomed back with open arms and people love the live band with the hip hop, playing hip hop. So it's, it's, been, it's been a beautiful experience. And I love the Blue Note. I love the staff there, I love the crew and all the people that have come to our shows have shown us love and like are blown away by hearing like a full band playing hip hop. So that's that's what we do. I mean, we're not obviously not the first. I mean, the roots, you know, <laughs> those are my boys, you know. So I just gotta say it's 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 been it's been a great it's been a great run of um shows I've been doing for the past 20, 25 years with all the different bands I've just mentioned different artists I've worked with over the time. I've worked with Vernon Reed from Living Color. I did an album with them that didn't get released. Uh, I'm on the uh, Batman Forever soundtrack. I did, my cousin, I could tell you this story. So my cousin Rizza, he, uh, when Wu-Tang started, he started to get scoring offers for movies. And he reached out to me and said, hey, you know, I, I, I got, I got this uh, song uh, that I want to put on the Batman Forever soundtrack. And I was like, cool. I, so he said, I want you to play on it. So I got to his house in Staten Island and he hands me a bass. He says, hey, cause I bought this off a crackhead for $5. <laughs> I was like, God damn, what a deal. So I, so I tuned it up. I said, what do, you, what, what, what do you want me to play? He says, just play the, the theme for Batman. I said, oh. It's just three simple notes descending up and down, but slow down. So I played it over a drum track and then I listened to it. I was like, it sounds empty. It needs something else. So I went on the synthesizer at the last minute and was checking for some sounds. And I added this like ding, ding, ding over the top of that, that bass line. And luckily he had, he was recording because I just added it at the last minute. And then he listened back to it again. He was like, okay, it's finished. We finished that track in a good hour. Wow. Yeah. Cause I'm a spontaneous guy. I like to like, if something strikes me, I just do, do it. You know, if it's in my head, I'll commit, I'll com commit it to, to the track or whatever I'm working on. And now the, in the album, when it appeared on the album, the, the Batman Forever soundtrack went multi-platinum because of Seal's Kiss from a Rose. Mm -hmm. and RZA received the record award with my name on it, on the plaque. He lost it. He loses the award. I said, dude, I come to your house and you have record awards, platinum, multi-platinum record awards all around your house, and you lose my record award. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> life is unfair, you know? <laughs> but... I'm not all about like awards and everything. It's all about the legacy I leave behind. That's important. So I don't care for like, if, if I won a Grammy, yeah, that'd be great won a Grammy. That gives me more, you know, options, more, not options, but more opportunity. Mm -hmm. But uh, I'm not, I, that doesn't, that doesn't um, do anything for me as an artist. You know, I, I feel that leaving a legacy behind is, is it has more weight than just having a, an award, you know, so I'm a humble guy. So <laughs> stay, I, 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 I make sure that the things I do is for, to help others, to influence others. That's, that's my, that's my reason to be here on this planet. You yeah. Know, and inspire people. people. That's inspire, why I asked yeah. you to be on the podcast because that's what I try to do is showcase people who are inspiring to help Thank inspire you. other people to like do what, what, is right for them, you know, and not yes. necessarily what society tells you to, to be doing, you know, really think for yourself and just go with your passions and your creativity and your talents. Right, indeed, because these days people are so fixated on how many likes they get on Facebook or Instagram, and that's what they thrive off of, but that's, that's just empty, you know, it's, it's like, cal like having empty calories, you know, you it doesn't really help anything. It doesn't really do anything for you, you know, in the long run. So, you know, I'm, I'm proud that I have a legacy. I left a legacy behind with all the different music projects I've, I've been involved with. You know, I get, and it's funny, I, I get, I get 
um, how would you say? It? I would I I get kind of shy or intimidated when people say, well, "You're a legend. You're a living legend." I'm like, uh, "No, I'm me. <laughs> I'm just me." You know, I I I I don't. Legend is this. It just states something else, like a person. Like I would say, Michael Jackson is a legend. Prince is a legend. James Brown is a legend. The Stones. You know, all these all these people that I look up to, they're legends to me. You know. I'm 56 years old. I'm not a legend. <laughs> so I, you know, I just, I just, I, I, and I'm grateful that, you know, I have people willing to say that to me, but I know I, I can't, I can't accept that I'm a legend. I'm, I'm just a regular human being. Just yeah, but legends it, you know? are people too. And that's the yeah. thing. Then there's another generation coming up that then looks up to you, just like you looked up to the previous generation. Right. You know? Indeed. Indeed. So and I'm, I'm, I'm proud. I'm, I'm just proud that, you know, I'm, I'm able to still do what I do and, and still get so many opportunities my, coming my way. But, but also I, I stay busy. I, I'm constantly in, in, involved in music and, 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 and performing and recording, but also getting, getting my face out there and, and, and it's not necessarily just getting my face out there, but also um, touching other people's lives. That's 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 the point that I'm making, you know. So you know, it's it's a beautiful, it's a it's it's beautiful. It's a God gifted gifted. I'm I'm thankful to God that I have this that has given me this talent, or she's given me this talent because I can't say God is a male or female, but you know, uh, I can say both. But um, I'm I'm gr I'm grateful that I'm alive and 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 I can still spread my gift and, and joy to others and inspire others. Exactly. That's what it's all about. You know, you mentioned the Blue Note, and I have to tell you that I I got to, my favorite show I got to see at the Blue Note was um I got to see Jimmy Scott. And yes. That was such a treat! Oh my God. Yeah, I can imagine. <laughs> unique unique talent unique yeah, voice talk I mean, about a legend mm -hmm. yeah and we're losing a lot of them now i mean they've like like uh like sydney 48 just passed so mm -hmm. uh um uh from the ronettes uh yeah ronnie from the ron from the ronettes just passed i dedicated mm -hmm. the show to her and m2 mate when i did the jizzle show you know, the last, this last couple of shows, I mean, it's, uh, I've been dedicating like to people that I, that I admired. And, and I remember um, I played, when I played the Blue Note in March, you know, I was like mentioning all the people that, all the rappers that have passed and dedicating the shows to them and Bismarcky and, and, and Fife Dog and, and MF Doom. And uh, it's, 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 it's losing a lot of good people. Like this world has become so hard to sustain yourself in, you know, this, this, this climate is so like, it's so much like uh, harshness and hate, hateful uh, people, you know, the atmosphere, this, this is like, this is like killing our good people, off, you know, killing our, our wonderful, beautiful souls and just, it's just like withering away. That's what's happening, you know? But we have to manage and to circumvent and navigate through it. But some for some others it's hard, you know, and I understand. But you know, I I gotta stay in the I gotta stay in the fight. I gotta stay in the fight for us because we're 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 the ones that are loving and kind and, and we wanna we wanna uh, have more people like that out there and help get, make be better this world. Yeah, music and creativity really helps with that, you know, if yeah. you have some creativity. And I feel like everyone has some sort of creativity, whether it's music or art, or photography, art, yeah. or yeah. just something, even gardening or cooking, you know, those are yes. all like creative too. People just like need to do what they feel compelled to do. And that makes the world a better place. It, indeed, indeed. You know what I too, what I enjoy too, I, I, I have a guilty pleasure. When I go on social media, I usually look at baby videos and kitten videos, <laughs> but also I look at a lot of architecture videos because I'm into Art Deco, I'm into um, 
uh, God, I just like, yeah, Art Deco design. I love Art Deco design. And also, um, for me, that's like inspiring to watch these like designers make houses or make a, um, they, they build these like uh, apartments or rooms and make them, make them multifunctional. And I'm like, wow, it's like blowing my head up. Like, you know, and in my mind, I'm like, that's my dream home. I would love to have a home like that. Just like make everything multifunctional, you know, like having, having uh, like a table fold up into a damn um, shelf, like a rack shelf, you know, or, or um, I've seen some crazy things that, that I was like, wow. They do really I crazy things. I watch yeah, videos like beautiful. that too, because my dad's a carpenter. And so I grew up always like looking at buildings and he's always like talking about how things are done and teaching me that kind That's of beautiful. stuff when I was a kid. So I'm always That's looking at stuff like that too. <laughs> That's great. You know, it's for, speaking of carpenter, I, uh, carpenters, I, um, I tell you the story. I was doing a session in LA, downtown Hollywood at the universe, it was, uh, I think it was Paramount Studios, but not the, not the film studios. There was an actual studio called Paramount Studios. And uh, <clears throat> I, when, I knew the studio because by reading the liner notes, when I was a kid, I used to read liner notes on the album covers. I, I always wanted to know where was it recorded? Because if it was a classic record, I'm like, oh, okay, oh, they recorded it at this studio. So I knew Johnny Guitar Watson, ain't that a, B you, was recorded there and ain't the, a real mother for you was recorded there. The session that I was doing was with um, Col, uh, Colin Bailey Ray. I think that's her name. She's from England, English singer. And uh, my cousin Rizzo was producing a track for her. So, but she, she showed up at the studio with my cousin, but I got there early and the engineer was like, I, I said, I told him, wow, this is a huge studio, man. I, I see like Montel Jordan recorded, um, this is how we do it here. And, and Macy Gray recorded her two albums here and Sly and the Family Stone recorded Stan here. And he was like, yeah, you know who built this room? And I was like, who? He says, Mark Hamill from, uh, it was uh, uh, Star Wars. Yeah. <laughs> I said, the, I said, the actor, like, yeah. <laughs> He said, yeah, you know, he was a carpenter in the 60s. I said, yeah, I heard about that. He said, yeah, he built these rooms. I'm like, get the hell out of here. I was like, wow. And then he says, the, the room where your drums are, because um, the room, the, this actual studio was huge. I mean, like humongous. He said, right in the corner where your drums are, Jimi Hendrix performed there. I was like, are you kidding me? Like, dude, he said, in 1970, they had a party in this room, this studio. And they had like a, a psychedelic light artist in the, up at the top in the back in the corner of the studio. And Jimmy and his, and his group, I think Mitch Mitchell, or it was Mitch Mitchell and probably Billy Cox and a few other people jamming right there, right where your drums are. I'm like, wow. I said, when I walked in, I could feel the energy. I could feel the, the vibe in here. So I'm in the right place. <laughs> so it was always fascinating to, like, to find out the history of places. I, I'm always about that. I'm yeah, I love that, that too. You know, because <clears throat> it's like you, 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 like I'm always. Every time I go into a building, I feel, I feel a vibe about it. You know, mm -hmm. I, I remember walking down from the studio. I was going to Amoeba Records, which is not in that location anymore. It moved to another location, but uh, I found the uh, Roosevelt Hotel, and or then I think it was the Hotel Knickerbocker. I think it was the Hotel Knickerbocker. That's what it is. And uh, that's where Marilyn Monroe stayed at, Frank Sinatra, all the Hollywood stars stayed at. So I go to the front of the entrance of the building. And at that time, it was a senior citizen's home. They made the hotel into a senior citizen's home, senior citizen's home. Now they turned it back into a hotel just recently. So I was standing, looking up at it, and this elderly woman says, excuse me, you know about this building? I go, yeah, I looked at her, yeah. She said, you know, it's haunted, right? I go, yeah, that's why I came. <laughs> so she said, I said, I asked her, could I go inside? She said, yeah, you can go inside. So I walk inside the lobby. 
and I'm getting ready to take out my iPhone. The security guard says, yeah, you can't take any pictures here. I said, oh, I'm sorry. I put the phone away. I said, hey, I heard about the history of this hotel. Is it true you can hear Montgomery Cliff on, I think, what floor, whatever floor. He's, he's pacing up and down the floor. He was reading a script from here to eternity. I think he was in the movie From Here to Eternity. But he's, he was pacing the hallway. He said, oh, yeah. He said, there's a lot of hauntings here. I was like, wow, okay. And I just said, hey, have a good day. And I walked out. <laughs> I love so it. It's, yeah, it's, I'm always <laughs> fascinated by stuff like that. And when I was in London, I went to Vindal, visit Handel's and Hendrix's of the building. Handel owned the building and that's where he lived in the 1700s. Um, I think it was 16, 1700s. So, I went there, my wife and I were taking pictures and she, she wants to take a picture of the room and everything. So I said, all right, I gave the camera to the lady that worked there. So she's taking, she's taking a picture of us in front of Handel's bed. She told us the story of how Handel had to sit up in bed to sleep because he had a, he had a issue with his stomach. And every night he would have to sit up in bed and sleep. So we take, I, I, she took the picture of us in front of his bed and I'm, I proceeded to take some other pictures of Handel's place. So we go to the other side of the building and go upstairs and that's where Hendrix's pad is. Oh. When I walked up there, I was like, oh my God. I looked around, I was like, wow. And I felt it. I just felt it immediately. Um, the only thing, everything was replicas. The only thing original was the mirror. It's when Hendrix had died, his girlfriend, Monica Danneman told the, the uh, proprietor to throw out all the items but not the mirror because it would be bad luck to throw out the mirror you know so that's the only original thing in H hendrix's place mm. and they made the whole li uh, living room area a museum so when you go into the bedroom everything is, is exactly a replica everything except the mirror so we leave the place and i'm like still like buzzing about being in hendrix's spot and i go down to the main floor and buy some like souvenirs we get outside i wanted to go to carnaby street so my wife is like can I look at the pictures of what you took? I was like, okay, I give her the camera. And she's looking, she's scrolling through and she says, what happened with this picture? And I look, the picture of us in front of Handel's bed, it's a what a shadow and a light a streak. It's like a, sh it's this whole thing is blocked. You don't even see our waist. All you see is our uh, shoulders up. I, and I looked at her, I said, what do you think that is? She says, the ghost? I said, obviously it's his ghost. He took a picture with us. <laughs> so <laughs> I said, what, what can you say that? And then uh, when I checked the other pictures, it was all clear. That was only that pick one picture that was, that was uh, blocked. Mm -hmm. That blocked our whole view. And all you could see was our shoulder up. That's uh, like our neck and up. And I was like, I looked at it, I was like, whoa. And I looked at it and I said, what do you think it is? She said, it's a ghost? I said, yes, that's his ghost. So years later, I looked on my computer to look at the other pictures that I took in Handel's place and I failed to notice it on the camera, but I saw two orbs in all the pictures. Ooh. Yep. And the lady told us that Handel used to train two students uh, vocal lessons, give them vocal lessons. These operettas, uh, two women that he trained and taught or, or teached. And uh, I said, hey, it could be them too. <laughs> so, so she said that ghost are frequently seen or heard and also handled. So yeah, that's, that's in the pictures on my phone. I still have those, those photos. But I, I always have stuff. vibrations about place. Yeah, me too. I mean, I've had many instances of like feeling things or hearing things, you know, in certain places that I've been in. Um, I uh, did a show with a Donna, a Donna Summer tribute artist named Rainier Martin. And the members of Funk Face, that was Jeff, Jerome, and Frank on bass, played with her also. So we were all like four members playing with her, plus other horn, a horn section and two other background singers. We did a gig in, I forgot what part of Virginia it was, but the area that we played in, we played on this like stage outside near a dock where there's a bridge and there's like a river. That's where slaves um, lived. They made that into like a, uh, like a museum, I think that area. And 
we walk we had to we walk back to the um hotel when we went to book into the hotel i never forget this the whole band is huddled around we waved for our rooms and the woman says oh by the way guys this hotel is haunted we all look at each other like and she says well there's a ghost in the library section when you walk in there's a there's a library section she said that if you put the books in the wrong place the book somehow ends up in the right place where you <laughs> took it from it, it ends up there there's also a ghost of a little boy in the in the basement i'm like oh where the bathroom was and then she says she proceeds to say there's also a ghost of two girls on the fifth floor i think and that's where my bass player was staying and <laughs> with sharing a room with jerome and he said damn i gotta stay i gotta i gotta I gotta stay in that room and but she said that floor was haunted by two two young girls <clears throat> so we do the show that day we come back to the hotel we're celebrating with drinking at the bar and everything then we all go to our rooms the next day we check out the whole band is in the basement congress uh, not in the basement we're all in the lobby congregating we're all talking about the show yesterday about how great it was one person that's not talking is the bass player. So when we finish our conversation, Frank is like, has his head down, he's looking at us. It's your know, guys. Somebody, something touched me last night. Something was happening on my leg twice. Then the horn player says, Oh, well, maybe you had like a re like maybe you had REM sleep. And I looked at him, I said, dude, he said he was wide awake. He wasn't asleep. He was wide awake. Why are you everyone always has a, a like a, a dumb excuse about somebody else's experience. They're telling you what they experienced and you're telling them something that has nothing to do with anything. You know, I said, if you don't believe in ghosts, just say you don't believe in ghosts, you know? So- Exactly, but don't negate somebody else's experience. Right, you know, and that's what I, I, I told him. I said, don't, 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 don't dictate what you think happened to him or what he, and, and he said that, I sh he said, dude, I was sharing a room with Jerome, but Jerome was asleep. When I found, when I turned around to see what tapped me. Cause mm -hmm. I was laying down and I was, and it just like that on my leg. And I was like, I jumped up and I looked and Jerome was asleep, knocked out. So <laughs> I said, there you go. I said, I, I, I think for me, I'm, I'm more sensitive to spirits so they don't bother me. <laughs> so I, I leave it at that, <laughs> but I did yeah, exactly. capture. Yeah. But I, but for me, you know, I'm, I'm thankful that uh, a lot of my, uh, groups and a lot of the uh, shows that are coming up, I'm, I'm, I'm thankful they're like filling up my plate and I'm about, you know, I'm, I'm just embarking on trying to get to the next level. You know, I, I just want to make sure my band, Rebelmatic, especially we, we get to the top, you know, we get to the top and, and, you know, show the world what we're all about. You know, and whatever project I'm in, I'm, I'm always getting involved in it, be, whether it be punk, rock, metal, funk, hip hop, you know, I'm rocks, I'm all over the place. I'm a chameleon. So music is music to me. There's, there's two kinds of music, bad music and good music. <laughs> you know? I always like to put a song at the end of the episode. So if there's any song you want to send for me to include at the end so people can hear it, that that would be cool. Sure. Uh, it'd be one of my bands. So it'd be, have to be Rebelmatic. So I'll tell you what song. Born to Win. <clears throat> nice. Yes, Born to Win. And uh, it's a, that's so on every platform. You can find that on any platform. It's on Bandcamp or so. It's on Tidal uh, uh iTunes so yeah that that's pretty much what I'm up to now you know I'm still doing my thing and uh uh still involved in a lot of different projects groups and playing with tribute bands that's how I make my living thank god uh, and I have this is the, actually this is the third year I've been working for myself 2000 and 2018 I was working at a, a, a stereo shop that was a stereo shop slash record store. It turned into a coffee shop around 2018, 2017. Oh, it's not there it only anymore? Lasted, no, it oh, went out of no. business. The stereo shop is still there, 
But when I started working there, mm -hmm. I started working in 2014 <clears throat> and we had record store days and the lines would be up the block and people would come there all the time. Rick Rubin used to shop there. Um, I met Robert Plant one day. He literally was uh, looking through the window when I had the store closed. I was about to open it and he, he was peeking through the window. I didn't, I, he, I didn't see his face, so I didn't know who he was. So he was peeking through my window and I just like, you know, looked at the people standing there. So I said, you know, I'll open at 11 o'clock. So <laughs> the guy was still going like this and I went inside and then I opened the store. He walked away with this blonde. I opened the store around 11 and my friend brings in some used copies of Led Zeppelin album, like third pressings, second pressings of, wow. of like different Led Zeppelin albums. So I always buy use any Led Zeppelin, Beatles, anything like that. So I had them on the counter. I'm cleaning the record, looking it up on Discogs. And I have my back turned, I'm playing records and I hear, hello mate. I turned around, it was Robert Plant. I was like, dude, what the F are you doing here? He says, I was peeking through your window. I was like, dude, that was you? I said, Mr. Plant. You're one of my heroes. Your band, John Bonham, is one of my favorite drummers. Um, would you mind looking for a record while I try to calm down? <laughs> he says, sure, <laughs> sure. <laughs> so I'm like standing there like, I can't believe this guy's in my store. Like, <sighs> So he comes back and I said, um, wow, Mr. Plant, what, what brings you here? He says, Oh, you know, I, I saw you had Led Zeppelin albums on the wall. I said, well, of course, I had the new re reissues of Led Zeppelin box sets they had of those albums. That's why he came back. He said, oh, this guy loves my group, so I got to come back. He got the albums all over the wall. So that's why he came back to my store. And he says, Miss, he says, uh, do you deal with Warner Brothers? I go, yeah. And he says, um, okay, and he walks away. So I'm like, why is he asking my, that question? So I look at the website, the distribution, and it was, I look at Wea, which is Warner, and I saw that he had a new album coming out. He comes back up to the counter. I said, Mr. Plant, I will carry your record. He says, oh, God bless you. God bless your heart. I said, dude, man, you're a freaking icon, man. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> and I said, man, I love you, man. I love your whole band, Robert Plant, John Paul Jones. Jimmy Page and John Bonham. I said, dude, I love your whole band, man. I mean, I, I, I listened, I bought your records in the seventies, you know, and in through the outdoor I bought when it came out. So I gotta say, man, he said, dude, how old are you? I said, I'm 56, man. He said, wow, okay, okay. He says, so thank you so much. I said, uh, if you, I said, if you're in the area with Jimmy Page, man, you know, that's wishful thinking or, or any of, of your band, man or John Paul Jones, man, feel free to come in. And uh, he said he had a plant and they took off running out the store after him because <laughs> they wanted to meet, meet him. It was great. It was, it, was, it was a great experience. So, and Jack Cassidy, I met too from Jefferson Airplane. He was, he, he was like, I, could, I didn't recognize him because he's, he's short, but just like when I finally, when he said Jack Cassidy and I really looked at his face, I was like, whoa, dude. I said, no, people don't even realize you played on Voodoo Child with Jimi Hendrix on, on his Electric Ladyland album. I said, he said, yeah, I know. That's on the slow version. He's on bass. That's not Noel Redding. Noel Redding was on the fast version. So yeah, I'm all about music history. I'm, a, I'm like a, a, a theosaurus of music. <laughs> Absolutely. Knowing who played on what. Yeah, you know, it's like, I hear a song, oh, this is so-and-so, and this is... And it's, oh, go ask Ramsey. Ramsey knows everything, you know, <laughs> like Mikey eats everything. <laughs> yeah, I know. That was just so much fun to just hang out at the record store and chat with you forever. I love yes. to do that. Yes, yes. Yeah, it was, it was, it was, I miss those days, you know. I worked at Tower, I, I worked at Tower Records in, from 1990 on my birthday, November 2nd. I worked there November 2nd, 1990 up until um, 2006, December 25th, no, December 24th, 2006. This, and, and no, it was 20, yeah, it was the 24th. The 25th 
James Brown died the next day. That's why I remember it so vividly. So, yeah. And I remember yeah, coming in and getting getting David Bowie's last record on Friday and then like yeah, Monday the or Star. Sunday or something, he died. And I was like, what do I do? And I just Hi. went back to the record store and hung out there with you all day. And people just kept coming yeah. in and being like, David Bowie died. And then everyone was just talking about it. It was like the best way to process a death ever. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it was. He lived right up the block. Yeah. He lived right. Yeah, he lived right up on Lafayette. He lived on, uh, what's the, um, uh, there's, a, there's a scotch and soda. There's that, that store scotch and soda on the corner of, um, what's it, not Prince. I forgot what street it is. But on uh, Lafayette, but somewhere right around there. Yeah, it was a building. There's a white building near the tat. There's a tattoo parlor right there, big, like high end tattoo parlor. That building, that's where he lived. That white building, right up on, right across the street from uh, it's, uh, Houston, East Houston, and on Houston Street. The the next block over that building, he lived right in the middle where um, the Wanamaker. There was a that the, the, had the models on the top of the uh, building with a little boy with that top hat on, right on the top of the building. He lived in the middle of the block. Now they said, "Yeah, David Bowie lives over here because he used to go to the bookstore right around the corner." That I I, I would go in there and then had had pictures of him in there. I'm like, "Oh, David Bowie shopped here too." So, yeah, I tell you, it's David Bowie story. This actually happened when Funk Face played CBGB's. And uh, I didn't notice this happening because I was playing, but Luke Mon was, he's my lead singer from Funk Face. He said, dude, man, I was, it, people were slam dancing and I saw David Bowie in the audience at CBGB's with Iman, his wife. So I, I'm slam dancing, like on, I'm, I'm, then I stage dive and ended up stage diving on Iman by mistake. <laughs> David Bowie said, Take, get, get off my wife. He said, I'm sorry, Mr. Bowie, I didn't mean to. <laughs> I didn't see it, I was playing. But he told us, he tell us that story every time, you know, and, and David Bowie kind of calmed down, you know, but yeah, he was at our show. <laughs> Very cool. Seeing funk face and live, live, all full, full live action. Just like our shows were crazy. Our shows were off the chain. Funk, funk face had a huge following in the nineties, and I, I wasn't in the band yet. The original drummer, um, I forgot his name. See, you get older, you start forgetting names and whatnot. <laughs> but he, he played. He was the original drummer for Funk Face. I'm trying to remember his name. It'll come to me. But uh, uh, I remember seeing them at the at this spot called Mars in Manhattan. Now Mars had five floors of music. My friend took me there. He said, "Yo, I'm gonna take you to see this band Funk Face," and he was close to those guys. So I said, "All right." So we go to we go to like the West Side Highway. That's where Mars is. It was five floors of music. The basement was hip hop. That's why I saw met Funk Master Flex right dj and this is before he was a radio disc jockey wow i went to the second floor reggae dub reggae oh, it was amazing third floor new wave oh god it was it was it was heaven new wave post-punk then the and then the fourth floor i think it was dance music like house music i was like yeah this is crazy like oh it was just a like a mishmash of all everything we love know and love like all crammed into like four floors. My friend comes down to the basement, was like, cause I went up to all the floors and I went back down to the basement. My friend says, uh, comes down to the basement, says, you're the fun face is going on. So we, we go up the stairs, go all the way up to the top floor. The room is packed. I'm like, yo, this band is that popular? And they get on stage and the, the lead singer is like dressed like, like like uh Bootsy Collins, like he had, he's wearing a diaper. And I'm like, okay, this is some funkadelic shit. They blew my mind. It was like red hot chili peppers, like uh that vibe that, that it was it was amazing. And then I walked up to them, I walked up to the drummer first and I said, dude, I'm a I'm I'm a now I'm a fan. I'm a fan of you guys. And then I became I became close to them and they used to have my band open for them. You know, so 
the band was called Abstract. That was the, the guy who introduced me to them. He was in, my, in the band Abstract. And that's how I got to meet Funk Face. And five years later, I became the drummer of Funk Face. Because <laughs> their drummer went AWOL. So, um, but yeah, we played the CBGBs. The first show I did with them at CBGBs, it was packed wall to wall with people. Even on the stage. Now you've seen CBGBs, how the stage was like, had the had the um, uh, kind of like a, a wall in the back and it and, and that's where the mix I think the mixing board was out out near the audience but in the back people could sit behind us on so we were playing and I remember we were doing this song called Oh Yeah by by Funk Face and this fat guy walks up on stage while we were playing and I'm and we're like almost towards the end of the song rocking out people are rocking out with us all of a sudden this guy takes his shirt off and I'm like. I'm looking at the guitar, so I'm like, oh, he's gonna stage dive? Takes off his pants. I'm like, oh my God. <laughs> and the song is called, Oh Yeah. So my, my lead singer is going, Oh Yeah. Oh Yeah. It's, and then he's there taking his pants, so he goes, Oh no. Oh no. Takes his drawers <laughs> off at the very end of the song. Everybody went, Oh my God. It was like this, like covered in the eyes of guys, butt naked on stage. And he's just doing, playing with himself, playing with himself. I was like, oh my God, I have the recording. I still have that recording <laughs> of our show from 1995 CBs. I still have the cassette in the closet. And someone, there's pictures of it documented on our website. There's literally, the, you see the guy on stage, go on funkfacenyc.com, look at our photos. You see a guy standing in front of the, <laughs> in front of the stage going like this. Covering his face. <laughs> and no one wants to see a 300 pound guy butt naked standing there looking at you like this. <laughs> and they were like this, oh no. But yeah, moments like that occurred often in a funk face show. <laughs> but those are those are those are great times, you know. I have great memories of like things like that occurring <laughs> but we, we you know we we've been around the band has been around for like 35 almost 30, yeah 30 35 years 30 something odd years and yeah we did the show at this at, at pianos in manhattan mm. and it, it, we sounded it sounded just like how we sounded like back then the energy was still there so yeah i love those guys it's frankie samanant his brother jeff you samanant luke mon brown on vocals uh, Tim, I uh, forgot his last name, pardon me, and the drummer, the original drummer from uh, Funk Face NYC. Well, also, if people want to really know about Funk Face, we, we, we have a song on the Tony Hawk Project 6 game called New York City. There's a video on YouTube of, of us, New York City. Check it out. Go check it out. It was done in a cold ass skate rink. <laughs> a skate bowl. It was literally like minus 10. It was like minus 10. And, and I wore like the skimpiest thing on, on it, on the, on the video shoot. The lead singer, it was so cold, his head was smoking. Oof. Like he was Mr. Heat Miser. That's how cold it was in that, that place. I can so, link to that too. Huh? I can link to that too. <laughs> See, I got, I got it right here. That's the, that's my band Funk Face. Nice. Yep. And oh, and Jerome Jordan on guitar. I forgot Jerome Jordan on guitar, and and Jeff, Tim, on guitar. See, that's that's us, all us. Nice. Very nice. Yes, and that's Luke Mon. That's the lead singer. Very cool. Luke Mon Brown. Uh, Jeff, forty ounce. You summon out. We call him forty ounce Jeff, but he doesn't drink forty ounces anymore. <laughs> <laughs> this is his brother Frank, Frank and Beans. You summon out. You see. Mm -hmm. All right. That's him. Wah. Hey. Yeah. All right. <laughs> animal. Animal. That's it. That's why I call me Ramsey Animal Jones. <laughs> All right, Tim Grove, that's the other guitarist. He would, he is amazing, amazing guitarist. 
and they can see close up. Yeah, yeah. Tim Grove. He lives in California now, his wife. The original drummer was Vernon Lemon. There's no picture of him on here, but his name is Vernon Lemon. And he, he amazing. Shout out to Vernon Lemon. Um, yeah, so that was fun, that's Funk Face. So you can check us, check us out on Funk Face NYC. You can also check out my current band, Rebelmatic NYC. Uh, we have uh, we're on Bandcamp, Title, uh, iTunes, um, Backslider. You can check out all Backsliders B A C H Slider, and Maafa M A A F A. We have we have a EP on Bandcamp. Definitely check it out. It's progressive hardcore, Afro progressive hardcore. Fantastic. I'll but, put links to everything. Yes. And also I play with Jizza, of course, the Wu-Tang Clan. My, I, I didn't also divulge this information, but Riz and Jizza are my cousins on my father's side. Jizza is cousin by marriage. Riza is my cousin on my father's side of the family. Because uh, his mother, aunt, my Aunt Linda, she passed away, Linda Hamlin. That, that's, that's, Riza, that's Riza's mother and uh, Divine which is uh, Riz's brother. They're all my cousins. Old Dirty Brasted, which is Russell Jones. That's my youngest brother. So I was, I'm was i the eldest in the family. I was the first born, Ramsey Jones. And then it was my brother, Mark Jones, Monique Jones, my sister. Then Russell Jones, Russell Tyrone Jones, also known as Old Dirty Bastard. My sister, Dion Jones, rest in peace. She passed away on my brother's birthday when uh, Russell, Russell Jones passed away uh, November 13th. My sister, passed, my sister passed on his birthday on, in 2011, uh, on, the, on the 15th. So, uh, and then my sister Lamar and A. Jones. So it was three boys, three girls. Then I had another sister, Aisha Jones, who was born outside of the marriage uh, my father, he got around, so he, I love, I love my dad. Both my parents, they're beautiful. So, uh, Aisha Jones, and then I have another sis, older sister who's older than me. Uh, so, Nisi. So, there you are. That's my family right there. <laughs> Talented family. <laughs> yes. Yep. Yep. So, yeah, we're all still around. My father, he's um, living in Florida with my mom. So. Uh, I'm I'm lucky that I had this opportunity to, to, to play in Florida a lot so that I can see my father because I don't know how long he's going to be around. So I got to face that reality. So, you know, I'm... That's where really, I'm from originally. I'm from Miami. Miami, wow, wow. Yeah, I, I born and raised in Brooklyn, Brownsville, East New York. But my parent, my mother lives in uh, Claremont near Orlando because she loves Disney. She loves the amusement park, so... <laughs> I mean, I'll be there. I'll be there in Tampa at Bush Gardens and I'm going to visit my family. So Bye. God bless. <laughs> so Vanessa, how, what have you been up to? I've, see, I've been talking about myself. What have you been up to? This is all about you. Um, uh, well, I, I moved to Sweden. <laughs> I would and, love to go to Sweden one of these days. And Well, you know, you have a place to stay in Sweden. Thank you. Thank you. Looking and forward. I actually just got my citizenship yesterday. Oh, congrats. Yeah, that was a big relief. It's nice to have citizenship. Yes, it's very how long different did it take than you? it did the day before. It was five years total. Wow. I know, wow. I can't believe it's been five years already. Yeah, it goes by <laughs> fast when you're in a nice, when you're in a really w welcoming place, you know, and, and, and they're, they're, love, they're kind to artists and musicians and and people from all walks of life, different walks of life, you know? So that I understand, it goes by fast. Here it's like, oh God, <laughs> you don't know what you, you don't know what you're gonna face walking out get, when you step out the door in this, in this country. So yeah, but I'm not saying I, I don't, like I dislike America, but I, 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 I do dislike what it, what it has come to with the people that are, you know, trying to take our right to vote away and, and the the hypocrisy of people, politicians quoting ML, uh, Martin Luther King's words and they don't they don't they don't even take they don't even um, they want to take our, our, our voting rights away. I mean the hypocrisy and the audacity, mm. you know. So 
it's this this is here in this country this is what we this is what i got to deal with but there sweden it's all different it's all different headset and mind mindset you know yeah they have a good social system here right and they're big right. on voting and making sure everyone's like educated about how like the government works and stuff right. like that you know right. so that people can make informed decisions and mm -hmm. yeah here here is a whole different beast <laughs> it's a shame but I'm hoping to get to, I'm hoping to get to Sweden. I'll tell you, I, I, being a musician afforded me the ability, to, afforded me the chances to go to other places. Like I've, I've been to Spain, I've been to Madrid, I've been to, uh, I've been to Australia. I, I didn't play in Australia, I've been to Sydney, Australia. Wow. That's the only place, but I wanna go to Melbourne. I love Australia, I love Australia. I want to, Japan, I've been to Japan, Tokyo. I love Tokyo. I love Paris and London. Ah. Oh. <laughs> oh i want to go back <laughs> i want to go back but i'm definitely going to make a trip to sweden definitely i'll let you know they'll love I, you yes yes I'm <laughs> you. i definitely i definitely want to go any any place other other than here i want to i want to go italy tuscany um milan oh that's my dream my dream is to have a spanish mediterranean home or maybe a, a home in, 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 in Milan or Italy. Anywhere so in the cool. Mediterranean would be great. <laughs> yes, anywhere. I, 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 that's my dream. That's my, that's my ultimate dream. Have frescoes on the walls and <laughs> tiled floors, you know, a, a gazebo, a garden. Uh, well, and compared to New York, especially, it's actually relatively cheap, you know? Yes, it is. It is. <laughs> I know. I know they're selling. They were selling uh, buildings out in, in some part. I forgot what part of Italy it was for one pound or something or one euro. I'm like, what? <laughs> but I they have this Instagram site called Cheap Nordic Houses, and all my friends are like, "Are these houses for real?" Because they're like pretty great houses for like fifty thousand dollars, eighty thousand dollars, a hundred thousand dollars, you know. And they're like, "What yeah. is wrong with them?" I'm like, "Nothing. It's just." you know, not as expensive here. <laughs> right. Exactly. You can actually get a house for a hundred thousand dollars and be like happy. <laughs> yeah, very happy. Unlike unlike here. <laughs> you you pay a room for, you they'll they'll charge you a room for like a, just one small room for two G's, you know? It's it's like what? Are you kidding me? Like it's really hard in New York. Yeah, it's, it's and this is hard for artists to even survive here. That's why, like I said, we have we're resilient to be able to overcome the the virus or all the all the all the uh the rent hikes i mean st still like like today like my my landlord may sell this house that i'm in mm. you know so i don't know what the future is going to be but i know i'm not going to go out and, and get try to find work to to sustain it i'm going to continue doing what i'm doing being being an artist and and you know i make a living from it but also I'm going to save money too. I'm not going to be dumb about it. I have to save money and and look look into the future and look and, and look into having some financial security. That's what I'm focusing on. So, but it's hard to have financial security when everything around you is going up and up and up and you, you can't have any stability, you know, to find the grounding, you know. It's hard, but I know I I I I I can overcome it. I know I can overcome it. And, and I'm not worried about it. <laughs> not worried about it too much. So it's all good. It's all wonderful. Vanessa, I want to thank you for having me on your, your podcast. Well, you're welcome anytime. Yes. I basically so started it when I left New York and I was moving here. And it took a it took a little longer than I had planned for to get my like residency permit. So I couldn't move mm -hmm. here right away, but I had yeah. already like given up my apartment in New York. So I was kind of just like floating around. Like yeah. visiting my parents in Florida and then coming here and then going back to Florida and stuff. And wow. then I just kind of like needed something to do because I was so used to working all the time. And then I was just kind of floating around. So I'm like, why yeah. don't I start a podcast and start interviewing interesting people I know? And it, <laughs> it's been like four years of it. And yeah, it's been fun. People like That's it. Great. A lot of people listen Boy, to it and like write me. And I'm like, I don't know. What, I'm like, are people really listening to me? <laughs> they are apparently. <laughs> But that's beautiful. I mean, because you know, it's with this pandemic, 
it, it, it made us re have to reassess things and uh, uh, work with the new kind of like, you know, people were out of work. So they were like, oh man, what do, what can I do? You know, and then they have the live streams or live streams. So we had to like kind of navigate ourselves into like reinventing. Exactly. Uh, Finding new ways. Getting, getting, getting um, across to the public or, you know, trying to get, trying to still work and, and then function in this, this society, you know? Exactly. But yeah, I mean, it's, it's beautiful. It's beautiful. I'm, 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 I'm grateful and I'm thankful and blessed. That's, that's, that's that have friends like you still around and you're doing your you're following your muse and doing what you love and that's what that's what it's all about you know yep we're doing it and we're still here yes we're still here we're still <laughs> here and and even even in the following years I'm, I'm my 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 intention is to become more uh i would say i want to get out all over the world i want to be all international like everywhere I, I want to I just want to just have my legacy speak for itself and 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 the music that I do you know just I'm going to be you'll see me you'll see me it's going it's, it's going to be on another know. level <laughs> you know I want to I want to collaborate with cats like Anderson Pack and and uh Farrell Pharrell Pharrell Williams yeah Pharrell, Pharrell Pharrell actually looks like my brother Mark they look alike. Let me see if I can find a picture. You, you, t you, uh, tell me, because I, I look at the picture of my brother. I'm like, damn, he looks just like they, Pharrell. Looks just like him. <laughs> but uh, let me see. I can find it. Won't take that long. It's here. It's here. Take your time. Yeah, go way this back. This is the last thing I'm doing tonight. After this, I'm going to bed. You're going to bed. Yeah. I go yeah, to bed yeah. so early now, and I just read and read and read until I eventually fall asleep. Hey, that's better than watching TV, <laughs> watching, you know, just watching, uh, binge watching like shows or whatnot. Well, I must say, I just finished, I just binge watched all the episodes of the show Fargo. Yes, which is, yes. Which is actually really good. And it's so interesting how they like have all these different storylines and then they show you like how they all fit together based on certain characters or certain places. And mm -hmm. I just yep. finished the last one today with with Chris Rock, and that was such a that was such a good season. Chris I Rock played, is a really good actor. Yeah, I know, I know. I I, I played it. I played in uh, North Dakota last uh, December with Dancing Dream oh, <laughs> of wow. all places. Yeah, they love Dancing Dream out there. Okay, I found it. I found that's it. exactly. They would love Dancing Dream here. This is the yeah, home of yeah. Ava. I, I'm hoping, yeah, because that's where they they come they came from. So they have an ABBA museum in stuff. I know. I think one that of my has, band like holograms bandmates. of them. Yeah, it's really weird. Uh, one of my bandmates went there and uh, told me that about the museum, and I was like, <laughs> that's "Wow, pretty I mean, they, they're icons. They're icons." Okay, here it is. Uh, let me see. Oh yeah, totally. Right. Yeah, I see it. But look at this one. My my brother's so sharp. He's wearing a hat now. So Very sorry nice. for the glare. Well, you all have amazing style too. That's we my younger brother. Talk That's... about your fashion. <laughs> yes, I didn't get into that. So <laughs> back in the seventies, when I was growing up, you know, I can tell you this. Like around how my fashion thing started, where where I get my inspiration from, around nineteen seventy, I was this is like around September of 1970. My, my, I, we were still living in, in, in Brownsville, Brooklyn. Brownsville is like a rough, rough area. I mean, that's the era of the gangs, like during like the late 60s and 70s, early 70s. Uh, I remember I was four years old. My father worked for the transit authority. He was a track worker. So they worked the third rails and I mean, dangerous job. He came into, he came into the room and I was playing with my brothers and sisters. He said, son, come watch the news with me. So I came in the living room and watched the news with him. It turned out to be Jimi Hendrix's death. It was, in, he just passed. And I was immediately taken by the way Jimmy looked on the, I saw, I saw all the images of Jimmy and he had all the groupies, but he had, his whole, his Afro and the clothes he wore. And I was like, wow, this guy looks interesting. 
but I didn't hear the music yet. I think the next day, my father bought Are You Experience? He brought that album home with the Beatles' first album, Meet the Beatles. We had a GE record player in the room. So my brothers and sisters would use it. My father bought us the Sesame Street album because Sesame Street debuted in 1969. And we saw it. I saw the first episode of Sesame Street. We all wow. watched it. And it was like, we knew this was something new and innovative. We were like, whoa, this is Big Bird walking around. Hey, hey, Oscar, you know. And, and, and Oscar was like, back then was even more grouchy. Than, what do you want, Big Bird? Why are you, why are you bothering me for? <laughs> you know? <laughs> but it was new. It was like a new, like, we met, nobody have seen, any, seen anything like it. Because you had your Captain Kangaroos and and your Sherry, Sherry Lewis with the uh, goat. She had the goat and everything. But Sesame Street was on some other, Jim Henson was such a genius. We, my father bought the record for us, the Sesame Street record. Mind you, that's how popular Sesame Street was. It debuted in 69, here it is 1970 and they got a record out. So he buys Are You Experienced with Jimmy and the Beatles first album. So I look at the album, Are You Experienced? I'm like, Wow, and I see the Beatles with the, the black cover, the famous black cover, mm -hmm. Robert Freeman shot with them, like just staring at the camera face, like straight ahead. And I was like, okay. So I put on the Beatles first. I'm listening to the Beatles. I want to hold your hand. You know, excuse my voice. I'm like, <laughs> that was bad. <laughs> but I heard that and I was like, wow, the British sound got my ears immediately. I was like, this sounds great. Then I put on All Your Experience. I put on Jimmy Hendrix's Purple Haze. I listened to that and I was like, whoa. And I hear all these weird sounds in it. And I'm like, then I turned to the back cover and I was like, mind Jimmy, blowing. Jimmy, Noel Redding, and Mitch Mitchell, and the Afros all together. I'm like, I want to be that guy. <laughs> I said, I don't want to be Hendrix. And then I started banging on things and pretending I was Jimmy by grabbing the broom and my brother. Russell, he would like see me say, I want to play. And I was all right. And I give him a coat hanger and he pretend to play drums. And then my brother, my sisters wanted to join in. So we were like a musical band in our imagination in the house. That's what bided our time. That's what kept us out of trouble. Because we, you know, we're living in the projects. So um, fast forward to 70, 78, 79. I was still, I was listening to, I was listening to Disco at the time, growing up on the Philadelphia International, you know, Teddy Pendergrass, the OJs, James Brown. But I also was listening to The Clash, The Clash that came out in 74, 75, and the Sex Pistols. And I was into the New Wave stuff. So new Wave came in the 80s, like early 80s, like 82, 83. So I, that my ear perked up when I started hearing like Devo and, and Blondie and The Police. Bauhaus, um, uh, Dead Kennedys. I was like, who was, what? I was like, what kind of music is this? And there was only one station playing it was WLIR. And that station changed my whole life. But they also had other shows. They had other psychedelic shows. They played like psychedelic music on the shows. So at the time I was like still finding my way like dressing, dressing up and I was wearing like the stuff of the time like Shams the Baron or Jordash jeans and stuff like that. And then around the eighties, I started wearing like a tie around my neck, like how Hendrix was were rocking it. We rocked the tie around his neck, the scars and all that. And people didn't know what to make of me. They were like in my neighborhood, we, we moved to Linden Plaza, which is East New York. It's on the borderline of East New York and Howard Beach or Queens. People would look at me like, is he gay or is he this or that? And I'm like, dude, like no one could accept me as, as I was. So I would go to the village, East New York. And I said, people don't judge you here. So I would go there. This was like early 82, 83. And hip hop came in, hip hop was already like, like vibrant during the late seventies into the eighties, nineties. So I was buying those big jeans, you know, all the hip hoppers would wear the big oversized clothes. So I was buying the jeans or pants oversized and I was like this is not me I'm not this is not my style but I, I was I could I could I, I could fit it in any style so I said you know what I'm going back to the 60s so I started dressing up again like that and then I got into the mod stuff the, the suits and right away the light bulb hit went off and I was like okay this is this I got this is me all I go going back to how I originally was like 
And then it got, then I started seeing, I started going on the internet, going on eBay, going on uh, Etsy.com and finding vintage clothes. And I'm like, whoa. And then I order it and it would fit me perfect. I always had a knack of finding clothes my size because people say, I don't trust the internet. You know, you never know, like it says 38 or, and then you get it, it's a 42. I'm like, for me, I never had that issue. I've always, know, I know my size. I know what waist size I am. And if I, I always lucked out finding clothes. Then I saw new clothing stores online only that were making clothes of that period of the late 60s, the mid 60s, mod, psychedelic. So I'm like, okay. And I ordered from the stores and, I'm, and then I said, oh, I got my look now. So that's how that came about. And this was like, it took a while, like 30, 30 years, 35 years or 40 years, you know? And I, now I, I just like, I can be comfortable in the damn uh, uh, sports, sports suit and also wearing like mod threads from the 60s, like, you know, vintage or new, you know, or I can wear a whole psychedelic getup. <laughs> and people are like, whoa, I love your look. Cause it's all about style. I, 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 it's instant with me and, my, and that comes from my parents. Both my mother and father were always dressed up. My mother used to design clothes for us. Remember the patterns back in the 60s, 70s? Yeah. And the parents would make, my mother literally made us like clo different clothes, get up back in the 70s. And my cousin Rizzo said, damn, y'all look like the Jackson 5. I'm like, yeah, because my mom, my mom hooked that up for us, man. You know? <laughs> so yeah, that's, that's, that's why I get my fashion sense from my parents and also references from the 60s, 70s, you know, 80s. So I'm, I'm and the punk thing, stuff, you know, the, with the, the chains and all that, you know, I can rock that. I can do anything. So I'm all about that. I'm, I'm a chameleon. So that's what it's all about. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> that's what keeps me young. You always got to always keep, stay, keep your mind fresh. Listen to new things. I never put down music of now because people always say, oh, music today sucks. It, it, it wasn't like back then. I'm like, but don't be an old fogey about it. You always, always listen. I'm always listening for new stuff constantly every day. I go on band camp. Bandcamp for me is the best place to find new music. Exactly. You don't find it on you don't find it on uh, Spotify. Hell no, you won't find no. <laughs> you 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 only find good stuff on Bandcamp. I go on Pitchfork. I look up like new releases, but Bandcamp for me, a hundred percent, you find the like the most amazing music by by independent artists on that site. Exactly, yeah. because now with the digital age, you know, everybody can put their music up the way they want it. They don't have to exactly. go through these labels that change it and make it more like normalized or palatable uh, to like a bigger audience. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So people can yeah. really do what they want and have their vision out there. Right. And that's why that's why I I always keep my mind abreast of new stuff and and never put it down. Like I love trap music. Before when it came out, I was like, yo, what is this? They're mumbling. But there were rappers that were actually enunciating words. But I'm like, okay, now, now, now is this is something, you know, when they when they enunciate the words clearly, I'm like, okay, I can and then when I heard Aunt, um Kendrick Lamar do a trap song or or or, or uh, Freddie Gibbs, thanks you. My son just said Freddie Gibbs. It's <laughs> Freddie Gibbs. He did a trap song and it was amazing. So I was like, you know what? That's what I'm talking about. They they can they can show these these mumblers like how to enunciate their words clearly and, and breath control. And, and I also love the verses that you ever you know about the verses they have on, on, on Instagram. I've been watching that. They have on YouTube. Ooh, what's that? I don't know that. Oh yeah. They had, they had a verses with, uh, uh, what's it? They had a verses with um, Big Daddy Kane against, against KRS-One. And it was at the Barclay Center. In here in Brook in Brooklyn, mm -hmm. but they have different ones. They had one with um, Stephanie Mills against Chaka Khan, but it wasn't like they were against each other. It was just almost like they were singing their hits and 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 to the to the audience, which was great. It's a great idea. I know um, uh, his son. Who's the guy? Oh, Swiss Beats. Swiss Beats actually is in charge of the verses in Timberland. They're in charge of the verses thing. So you got a lot of acts that are doing the verses. They had the locks against, the locks was against who? The dip set. The locks ripped it. I mean, they 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 took no prisoners. No, they, 
if you watch that performance, um, what's the what's the what's the uh, Jada Kiss right? Jada Kiss takes the other rapper that they're competing against. That because they're basically they're kind of like doing their doing their songs. Jada Kiss walked up to him and threw his head on the floor. And I was like, whoa! It's like battle mode. I love that. I love that. And and the crowds are huge. I mean, it's like you see Fat Joe in the audience. You see all these various rappers and 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 actors like like uh, Dave Chappelle will be in the audience checking it out. But those those series, those versus series, are amazing amazing you know and i'm glad that they have this form they had a they had a med they had a red man and method man versus which was amazing too so it's it's here in america so you gotta kind of like look on instagram when they mentioned it versus it's uh mm -hmm. -E -R -Z -Z. It yeah it's, it's amazing you can look at previous episodes on youtube because they have their own channel they have their own channel but that's beautiful because it's like you know it's keeping music, uh, it's keeping music alive and vital. You know, the, 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 en the energy, especially with all the new artists coming in and, and putting out their stuff. So music has like, it's just exploded with new, with new talent, you know, can, uh, like Anderson Pack, you know, mm -hmm. and you got Bruno Mars there doing that, 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 that Silk Sonic thing, which is beautiful, you know, bringing that old school sound back. But I'm working with an artist now named Avi Ajavo, which is more grittier than what those cats are doing. It's more funky. It's like uh, Sly Stones, there's a riot going on. And, and um, uh, <laughs> God, the, the, latest, the, la the latest 70s Sly stuff, it's in that dirt, like funkier, gritty. That's what I'm doing with this artist. We did, we recorded 15 songs. We already finished vo five, Tr vocal tracks on the five songs that he wants to put on an EP, but I'm I'm wanting to complete the whole project. But we did it during we we recorded the basic tracks during the pandemic. So I was I was busy. I was doing the Rebelmatic and Avi. You have recording. so much going on all the yeah. time, constantly. So I don't I don't ever rest on my laurels. I'm, I'm I'm like even during the pandemic, I was still doing writing, still producing. You know so. And now it's 2022, so I can't believe it. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> you're my first podcaster this year. Oh, thank you. That's a wonderful blessing. <laughs> thank you for having me on, Vanessa. It's it's been a great pleasure. Well, thank so, you for being here. And anytime you want to come back and just chat, just let me know. I will. I will definitely. I I think um I will probably hit you up in about a month or two, because uh I got some shows like i said in florida i'm doing but i'm going to really inform you about finishing this uh, ep that i'm working with this artist uh, avia Jalvo. we're trying to get i got like stella cats playing on it i got kurt from the roots on guitar on it i got chris rob on keys i got um uh doc burns on bass uh he's another cat i've been working with in the past on some demos which is on Bandcamp on the doc burns d-o-c b-u-r-n-z doc burns check out his stuff because this stuff is like rock funk you know and i'm on drums on all of those songs and i collaborated with them on some tracks so like i said I, I i like to leave a legacy all the artists that i mentioned that's just the tip of the iceberg i got it's a lot more <laughs> i know <laughs> you would know, say how come you're in so many bands i'm like I'm a musician. I can't be relegated to one thing, one band. That's not, that's, that's no growth in it. You know, you have to, you're a musician, you flourish. It's like a garden flourishing. You know, when the one flower dies, another seed, another seed is there. It'll just grow right in its place. Exactly. My more. friends that are, my closest friends that are working musicians, I mean, they're on tour all the time. My other friend, I have a friend named Emil Amos and he does a lot of like, prog rock kind of stuff and mm -hmm. he has like five different bands he's always on tour with somebody it's like right. i don't think he's ever home yeah that's <laughs> I mean, good. maybe now with the pandemic but in general he's just like always doing something <laughs> and that's what keeps us alive that's what keeps us going you know and mm -hmm. you know despite the, the, the despite the uh pandemic stopping all of our work two years ago 
you know, we were still able to overcome and, and, and navigate through it all and, and, and still come out on top, you know, somehow. But uh, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm in it. I'm still doing it. And I'm, I'm thank God, to, thank God that I'm to be alive. You know, I almost lost my life three, no, four, four years ago. I found that I had blood clots in my right leg. Mm. My right leg was swollen and I was, I was out in pain constantly and the pain progressively got worse. And this was like over 10 years. So around 2017, I went to a museum with my, a friend of mine. We went to the Met and he took a picture of me and I posted a picture and I was like, damn, I don't look too good. And that day the pain got so bad he said, dude, you want to go to the hospital? I said, nah, my friend that was with me. He said, so you want to go to the hospital here? I said, nah, nah, I'm going to go home. I went home and I had to call an ambulance mm. from my bed. And I called the ambulance. I got an ambulance. My son came with me, went to the hospital, Jamaica hospital. I laid there on a the stretcher and the doctor says, hey, so this is what you have. He gave me a printed out sheet of paper. It said phlebitis. It's P L E. P-L-E-B-I-T-I-S, I think, phlebitis. And the first thing I noticed in the description was blood clots. Then they released me. They just gave me a piece of paper and I looked at it and then they released me. I was like, they didn't do jack shit for me. So I, I looked, watched TV and I saw a USA vein clinic commercial. And I said, maybe they will know what, what I have. So I, had, I called them, made a cold call and said, listen, I'm suffering in my right leg I got this most extreme pain I don't know what it is I, it's like I can't walk so I went in the next day and they they had to scan my leg the lady had like this she had to put this thing against my leg to get the like a, a x-ray and it was painful of of the whole procedure of her just touching my leg I was wincing like this like oh and she said, all right, all right, all right. And then she said, listen, um, we got to wait for your insurance to clear such and such. So I, I went to work. I had to work with that lady. Oh. And I was playing shows. I was playing shows with this lady. I said, you know, in retrospect, I could have died on stage. I could have died working. So when I went in finally to get the surgery done, the doctor puts his mask on. He says, all right, Mr. Jones, we're going to proceed. So he, he, uh, scans it and he just he takes his mask off he says mr jones you want to hear the good news or bad news <laughs> i said let me get the bad news he said well the good news is you got blood clots i said yeah i know that he said the bad news is spread so far in your body you could die at any minute mm. <sighs> and i just like wow he said i'm gonna tell you what i'm gonna do i'm gonna operate on your left leg but you get you got to get i'm gonna give you a prescription of blood thinners get them right away i did go to the pharmacy. I took, I was taking a pill a day from November, no, October to November. He did the surgery on my left leg in November. December, he started the first procedure on my right leg. So it took like six, seven procedures to get all the, bl the blood clots um, blown out. Mm. And since then, I've been fine, hundred percent healthy. So um, thank God, knock on wood, that's, I'm here. <laughs> And he told me after, after those operations, he said, Mr. Jones, we need you. It's not your time yet. He said, you, you, can't, you can't go away from us. You can't die. It's, you, you're, there's a reason why you're here. So I said, no, doctor, thank you. I said, you saved my life, man. I never forget that. So, and Good for you for following up with a different place when the yeah. first place just sends you home. Yeah, this was a hospital. Ugh. This was a hospital that sent me home. So I said, you know what? I got I to gotta take care of this on my own. So I did, and now 2022, I'm here. You know, the last procedure, the last time I got checked on my leg was last year, literally last year during when I got my shot. I went to check out why I was passing out because I was passing out, and it turned out I was dehydrated. I didn't, I didn't drink a lot of water, but the doctor told me, so we check your leg, zero blood clots. I was like, thank you. Okay. I'm gonna keep it that way. Yeah. And so the doctor that originally did it, that did it, he, I was always going to him to check every year. And I went to a, pre, a different doctor who was giving me a different checkup, but he also checked for blood clots. He said, you're good. You're hundred percent clear. So I'm here. Good. Yeah.
I'm so uh, glad you're okay. Yeah, I'm great. I'm great. Because my playing, like, ever since I got that done, my playing has went through the roof. Like, <laughs> just, <laughs> it's gotten so much better, you know. Let me turn on the light in the back. Hold, hold on. Because it's getting dark. <laughs> All right. Yeah, it's better. Much better. So, yeah. So, yeah. I'm, that's why I'm, I'm still involved in music, doing doing all the different pr projects with my different bands and artists, and um, I, I'm very happy, I'm very happy. Despite whatever financial situation I, I'm in, I am happy doing what I love. That's what it's, what it's all about. That's what matters. Yeah. So, but that's uh, keep you posted on my uh, updates, and I uh, would love to do another show <laughs> yeah and i'll link to all the things you talked about and um and i'll have it up within a week so i'll send cool. it to you as soon as it's up this would be this is great this is great <laughs> it's so, so good it's, to talk to you it was a pleasure vanessa thank you so much for having me on your show it's a pleasure seeing you again after all these years you know i'm alive and well and still kicking kicking ass every every place i go to <laughs> I'll tell you this one last thing before we go. Yeah. So I did this show. I did this show last week in the Bluna with Jizza. And last Saturday, I was in Bridgeport, Connecticut with Dancing Dream. And the theater I played at was uh like it's like up it's up a flight of stairs. And next to that building where the theater is, it's a, a vintage clothing shop, thrift shop. And I walked in because I was curious. I love thrift shops and old, old gear, clothes, you know me. I walked in, I had a vibe immediately. And it was one woman that worked in that owns it. So I asked her, I said, excuse me, what did this building used to be? She said, I don't know, but it was listed in the green book. The green book was a book for black travelers to let them know what place was safe to go to what gas station they can go to, what hotel they could stay in, what lodgings they could, what restaurant they could eat in. She said, this building is in the green book. And I was like, oh my God, that's amazing. And that's, I was curious to find out what it was, but she didn't know. So she told me this story. She said, yeah, I acquire, I get a lot of things from different people and you know, I sell them, fix it up. But I remember, I said, do you ever get haunted items? She said, oh yeah. She said, I got a mirror from a customer and one day I walked past the mirror and I felt, I saw a face in it, freaked me out. And even before that, I felt like I was being watched from that mirror. But when I saw the face, that clinched it. I called the woman back. I said, hey, you better come get this mirror. <laughs> and she, she came to the store and got it. I can't, <laughs> I can't have, she said, I, I can't have haunted items in my store. I can't, I can't deal with it. She said, it's, it's it's like if there's an attachment to it, I'm I'm not going to have it in my store. I can't I can't I don't want to sell it. I don't want to have it here because I don't want that shit coming home with me. You know. Exactly. So I said, yeah, I, like I know. Dolls. I like, A lot of times you see dolls and you're like, that doll is not right. <laughs> yeah, I've seen. I've seen there's old vintage stores. There's old weird dolls. Mm hmm. Yeah, I know. I know a guy who had was on one of those paranormal shows. And he said, yeah, I bought this doll home from a vintage store. And it looked like, the doll looked like a Dennis the Menace type doll, but it, it looked odd the way the face was. And he said, dude, I kept seeing the doll on the floor the next day or in a different position. So I put my camera, I put my, my camera on in the living room and he showed us the, the film and the, you see the doll sitting there and all of a sudden the hand just falls to the side by itself. Yeah. And then, <laughs> there was another there was another video this one was more creepier the doll is sitting there and all of a sudden you see in the back the the reflection because he had another doll in the reflection the doll went like this had his face like this and turned like that straight i'm like yo <laughs> and it was another doll so that doll Ugh. whatever was in that doll made that doll's face like turn from here to here looking That's straight chills. You're just talking you can about see it, it in the reflection because the camera focused in you can see he said yeah he said i had to get rid of that <laughs> so yeah but it's crazy it's it's I'm, I'm just fascinated with the paranormal i really am because i 
I feel like like I, we all have our, our loved ones that have departed from us. They're around us. Mm-hmm. You know, I, 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 I believe that. So, you know, that's what keeps us out of harm. Well, no wonder you're so in touch if your birthday is November 2nd. Yeah, the day of the dead. (laughs) So that's like when the veil's the thinnest, they say. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, yes, indeed. So, yeah, and I I just, um, I I, I equate that with music. That's why, like, music for me, I'm very sensitive. Even when I'm writing, I you know, when I co-write with uh, with other people, then it's always the notes that, that, are important for me because it's it's like each note has a frequency that you want to give off that energy to other people and they they feel it you know so and that's mm-hmm. that's what music is all about it's about frequencies about certain frequencies that hit you in a certain way and make you feel something you know and that's that's my way of of of, of uh spreading joy and love and 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 cert, certain energies that w- will heal you from the inside you know certain frequencies that would li- literally heal you and music does that mm-hmm. so. exactly it's not just to hear it as like background music <laughs> no exactly it's a frequency and it can actually like penetrate it penetrates you mm-hmm. just quite literally yep oh yeah definitely so and I will continue that 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 path. <laughs> Thank you for listening to Rendering Unconscious. You've just heard a discussion with Ramsey Jones. Links to his various bands' websites are all included in renderingunconscious.org. That's renderingunconscious.org. You can follow him at Instagram at SatelliteJones65. And if you're in Florida, his band Dancing Dream will be performing at Bush Gardens February 8th to the 13th. And now... A song from Rebel Matic, Born to Win. Yesterday, this thing is gone, but today is here, and tomorrow's not promised, so we're gonna live every day like it's the last.